believe it that, you know, that whenever we drew up the state of Northern Ireland that we actually left those unionists in, in the Republic of Ireland and we didn't bring them with us. Well, there was quite a few of them in the first, in 22, but there's very few of them left now. And all government uh, offices there, you've got to speak Gaelic or you don't get the job, you know. Well, they have been largely eliminated, 10% uh, uh, when the border was drawn, and now about 2.5%. I think those figures speak for themselves. So if they did have a united Ireland today or tomorrow, what position would the Protestants be in? Perhaps an answer to that can be found in the experience of Protestants in the Irish Republic, in the place that many in the North still call the Free State, but regard as anything but free. How have Protestants there fared since partition? What exactly is their identity? And have they anything to say to the Protestants in the North? I'm very proud that I speak Irish and that I am a Protestant. I'm proud of both things. I remember my mother warning me time and time again, keep off religion and politics, or, or you'll get us all burnt out. I would hesitate to, to characterize it as a sectarian issue. I mean, there were maybe sectarian undertones in, uh, to the struggle. They behave as if they're an endangered minority, even though they're no more in danger, you know, than the man in the moon. But until there's an acknowledgement that the Protestant community in the North are not lost Irish men and women who need to be brought back into the fold, then I don't think we go anywhere. This is the town of Bandon in West Cork. For centuries it was an English town, a Protestant town. The old gates have gone, but there was a sign over them once which read, the Turk or the Jew may enter here, but not the Papist. They came originally from the west of England, Somerset and Gloucester, around 1590, in the years that follow that, settled here as the Elizabethan settlement. Originally, the, all the land was allotted to them in the plantation. You would find in parish records surnames from the 18th century and the same surnames still around the area today. Kingston, Jennings, Bottomer and so on. It is predominantly Church of Ireland. There has never been any sizable Presbyterian community either here or anywhere in West Cork. And the reason is that the Presbyterians did not have the land, they did not have roots in the area. There is a small but, for its size, a strong Methodist community. Again, people who do have land are the basis of that community. And there are small numbers of people of other smaller denominations. How Protestant the town is, Bandon? Today, oh, but it'll be less than 10%. And I'm talking now about the whole area. You see, most people nowadays, they don't actually live within a town boundary. And yet this area is a concentration of Protestants? There's a fair concentration of them here, yes, yes. There are people who have stayed here, their families have stayed here, partly because, I say, of having the land, and partly, as well, from strength of character. What do you mean by that? I mean that they were not blown away by the gusts of wind that came and passed. Well, I was born in a small town on the uh, Wicklow-Wexford border, South Wicklow, called Carnew. Victor Griffin's career straddled the border. For 14 years up to the eve of the Troubles, he was a Church of Ireland minister in Derry, watching the storm clouds gather, before he was appointed Dean of St. Patrick's, the National Cathedral in Dublin. My father... He was uh, at one time a motor engineer. I think he pioneered the motor in industry in those parts. Also involved in wireless and radio, and in farming, and in shopkeeping. He was a man of many parts, and uh, 
My mother came from Monaghan, and uh, she was a very steadying influence on him. I remember she used to say, if you go on like this, you'll land us all in the poorhouse. I remember being uh, brought up on the independence of the Celtic Church. It was felt in order to preserve our identity, we had to know where we differed and why we differed from the Church of Rome, which was the church of the majority community. And so we grew up with that idea of reverence for the Bible. We also uh, were, uh, had great um, hymn singing, and the Book of Common Prayer, of course, was the sense or the badge of our identity. Bridget, who used to come and work for my mother, and she used to bring me uh, as a child uh, up by Tom Cork uh, Chapel, which was her chapel, and we used to go in there, and uh, she would kneel down and say the rosary or something, and I would also kneel down, and in very, very audible voice, I would shout out the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, to the consternation of the worshippers. They had grown up, my father and mother, uh, under the British connection, of course. They were Southern Unionists. Uh, they would have regretted very much uh, the Republic, you know, and the breaking of the Union. Um, they weren't sectarian Unionists, though. They felt that the Union was beneficial for Ireland in its economic sense, in all, all sorts of ways. that and that the breaking of the link with Britain would lead to the division of Ireland and the partition which uh, they, they didn't uh, support at all. They felt that it was a pity that the price we paid for breaking the link was to divide Ireland into two parts. The main man of the Irish War of Independence was Michael Collins. More than anyone else, he started the war, he helped keep it going, and he signed the treaty which brought it to an end. He grew up here near Clonakilty, and he was killed 20 miles away at Belnabla by an IRA faction which wanted to keep on fighting the British. So this area, West Cork, suffered some of the greatest violence of that period. This was a particularly bad part of the country. There was a great deal of trouble at the time. A number of them had their houses burnt, a number of them were murdered, and why was the most it was always said that those who were murdered and so on was, were spies. Nobody nowadays can prove whether that was right or wrong. It was probably right in some cases, wrong in others. But there were people who were murdered simply because they were Protestants. I'm quite certain that a number of Protestants did emigrate after 1922 uh, in the belief that this country was no longer a fit country for them. Well, they have been largely eliminated. Ten uh, percent uh, when the border was drawn and now about two and a half percent. I think those figures speak for themselves because that means in terms of the Protestant population alone, that's nearly 80 percent of the Protestant population in the South since the drawing of the line have been eliminated. But that's a very complex story. It is sometimes presented as reflecting, in a sense, a type of oppression of Protestants uh, by uh, a predominantly Catholic state. The population of Protestants in what is today the Republic fell from, I think it was about 327,000 in 1911 to 128,000 or so, by nearly 200,000 by 1961. It has since risen to about 148,000. Uh, but if you break down the, the, the timing of the decline, you will find that about 60% of that fall occurred between 1911 and 1926. So there's a concentration of the decline in the period of political upheaval. When you try to break that down further as to the precise causes, you will find that more than half of that total is accounted for by the withdrawal of the British army and its dependents, which was of course predominantly Protestant, of officials, and by probably disproportionate deaths of Protestants who volunteered for the British army in the First World War. So. 
the, the number, I think, exaggerates fairly significantly the number of Protestants who felt obliged to leave Ireland as a result of the change of regime. The Protestant community, I suppose, up to about 1920, certainly, had a loyalty to the Crown, but the wiser among them after 1920 realised that circumstances had changed, there was a new state, they gave their loyalty to it. Those who remained felt that uh, they had to avoid giving any impression that they were being disloyal to the new state, and so they kept their heads down, got on with their business. I remember my mother warning me time and time again, Victor, keep off religion and politics. Uh, she'd have read or heard of something that I had said in a speech in Trinity College, condemning the whole idea of confessionalism and advocating a more pluralist Ireland. I was saying this in the early 40s, you see, and my mother would, would cringe when she heard this and she would uh, warn me to stay off these, for goodness sake, Victor. She said, keep quiet or you'll get us all burnt out. The Protestants did keep this low profile in, in the state and um, that gave the wrong signal to the majority in the state because the majority of people in the state felt that uh, Protestants really were quite happy, quite contented. They had nothing to be anxious about, nothing to be worried about. Therefore, why, since southern Protestants seem to be quite contented in this state, why don't northern Protestants think of coming in and they would be equally contented? What is this something else which is keeping the northern Protestants from joining the Republic? And they say, ah, they say, it must be the British, the British connection, the British. So therefore, if you get the Brits out of Northern Ireland, automatically you'll have a United Ireland Protestants will come in. When Victor Griffin went north, he found that his eagerness as a young Protestant for a pluralist Ireland sounded to Protestants in Derry like a fearsome heresy. The Protestants in Derry had a siege mentality. Uh, they were scared. They were scared, first of all, of being absorbed in a united Ireland under Roman Catholic control, scared of being part of a confessional Roman Catholic state. And so um, they took measures uh, to uh, see that that should not happen. Uh, and this, of course, led to uh, discrimination and uh, things which were later broadcast all over the world, you know. When I was leaving Derry, uh, I had a message, or one or two messages, good riddance to the Fenian. You're going back to your friends now, you see. Well, then I came down to Dublin in 1969 as Dean of St. Patrick's, and uh, I soon discovered how simplistic uh, the views were uh, about Northern Ireland. And uh, I began to say then that, um, uh, for example, uh, we talk about the north of Ireland needing to be cleaned up and uh, certain changes must take place in north of Ireland but also certain changes need to take place here in the Republic and we should clean up our own backyard before we are so ready to criticise our neighbour's backyard. Uh, and this didn't go down too well with certain sections in the Republic and I was accused of being an orange bigot and I was told to go back to Northern Ireland to my orange friends and all this. So here was a case where I was called a Fenian lover in the North and told to go back to the South and in the South I was called an orange bigot and told to take myself and my family back again to the North. Again, I said, you can't win in Ireland. That was 25 years ago. Ireland, North and South has gone through massive change since then. What traces are now of the old fears and animosities among the new generation of Irish Protestants? How have they asserted themselves in the southern state? Uh, by uh, the Protestant taxpayers and ratepayers of the country. Where in the south of Ireland is there a Protestant school that gets such liberal treatment? And we all know even the Protestant hospital recently in Dublin came under attack. Uh, so uh, there's inequality of treatment of the minority. You have only to take the percentages from 10% to 2.5%. And if that doesn't illustrate the genocide of an entire community, what else would do it? 
Well, the use of the word genocide um, would produce uh, two reactions in me, one of disbelief and uh, one that might make me burst out laughing because it's so inappropriate as to be ridiculous. Brian Duffy is a prominent Dublin Presbyterian who often comes north and...